Very good. Uh, again, it looks like there's no questions again this evening. So we can have a nice peaceful time. Is that correct? No. Okay. Here they all come. And I hope you're settling in to the retreat center, getting to know where things are, how things work. Here we come. I know the top question is from the Mexican monkey queen there, so what I would do, I'll Oh my goodness, there's a lot of them. I'll shuffle them. Good idea. Yeah, a lot of them. It's going to be a late night. <laughs> we'll see what happens. Okay. It's only 25 past. So is that too early to start? Is everybody here? Are all the important ones here? <laughs> I, th I think we can start. Here we go. Ah, I had a meditation experience. Well done. Next question. <laughs> Where just a short moment into meditation, my eyes blink and my heart beats uncontrollably. Your heart always beats. And if you don't control it, it's usually much better. I also feel object moving nearby. Am I meditating wrongly? What's your advice? Oh, what my advice is, is just let it happen. Don't be afraid. See what happens next. Look, when your eyes start to flicker a little bit, Sometimes that means a little bit of fear. If you are seeing these things we call nimittas, these lights which appear in the mind, I know that a few people, because it's, a vi it's not a visual object, it is a mental object, and, but because it's interpreted as a visual object, people kind of interpret it as a visual object. It can be very strong, and it's almost as if the brain gets a bit confused Am I seeing this or am I knowing this? That's why sometimes you flicker. But it doesn't matter, the flickering will soon disappear. And if you're worried about that flickering, just get a, an iPad. Because uh, you get these eye shades you can put on. And they actually can stop all of the, the doubt that you're seeing something. It's experiencing it through your mind. And then it stops. So you're not doing anything wrong. You can hardly do anything wrong on this retreat. So your heart, eyes blink and your heart beats uncontrollably. You mean really fast. Just remember the words, the three words. Relax. Actually, it's four words, isn't it? Relax to the max. And then things will settle down. And then your heartbeat will go back to its usual rate and that uh, your eyes won't flicker and you'll have a lovely uh, experience. Don't be afraid. Be courageous, adventurous, willing to see more objects you haven't seen before, going to places you've never been before. Be adventurous. Is that a good idea? Are Malaysians very adventurous or are they really conservative? They just want to stay where they are and don't go anywhere. I'm adventurous. I walk up all those stairs this morning. Twice. <laughs> no, it's okay. it's okay. It's good exercise. So there's nothing wrong with that. That's the kind of thing which will happen in the meditation. But don't be afraid. Let's go a little bit further into those experiences and you have a wonderful time. This is a chicken and egg question. I sent it to the right monk because I'm not a vegetarian. You shouldn't do chicken questions to vegetarian monks. 
That didn't go down very well, did it? I was trying to be funny. A chicken. Vegetarian monks. Vegetarian monks don't know anything about chickens, do they? Okay. Okay. Why did the piece of tofu cross the road? To prove it wasn't chicken. That's a joke. Come on. Get that one. This is a chicken and egg question on your talk today about being mindful first before focusing on the breath. Is this a fixed step one or step two procedure? Not really, but the importance is that you are mindful and when that mindfulness is strong enough, the rest of the meditation becomes easy. It's just following the Buddha's instructions to make the mindfulness the priority. Get that strong first of all. And after a while, you know when it's strong enough, you can watch the breath easily. You may be watching the breath, but the main point of watching the breath is to have this mindfulness, the ability to be aware. But what is Ajahn Brahm's definition of mindfulness? It is being in the present moment and being silent. And that means that, you know, it's a brilliant definition, I think, anyway. You know why it's a brilliant definition? Because it's my definition. <laughs> um, that's, that's another joke, okay, so it's okay to laugh at my stupidity. <laughs> but that's a nice kind of definition, because you have to be in the present moment. Otherwise, if you're thinking over there and thinking over somewhere else in the past and the future, you're not really paying attention to what's happening now. And if you're giving too much of a description, too many words, too many commentaries, again, you're not really aware of what's happening right now. Because of that, simple definition, be in this moment. And to help you be in this moment, be kind to this moment, and be silent. Don't give it a name. Anyway, that's only a bit of the question. Is this a fixed step one or step two procedure? To a moha type of person, loves to fight, gets annoyed easily. There are occasions where the emotion is so strong inside that pure awareness alone of the anger, frustration does not get rid of it. And maybe focusing on the breath by, by a sitting meditation on the steps, walking meditation works better. Great. What's your take on this? And consequently, what about the same question for the other types of delusion, etc.? Now, we have like restraint. And like restraint is not just sense restraint, it is also just restraint of bad actions of you know, body, speech, and mind. So you get upset and angry. Why? It hurts yourself and it hurts others and gives people a bad impression of you. So instead of using anger, it's much better when you have that restraint enough so you can see anger start to come up. And when the anger's coming up, you can stop it before it takes over you. How many times have you been angry? And what's the result of that? Does it get you anywhere or just gets you into more mess? So after a while, you make it very clear that those, what I call, I used it, called it the, the simile of the snake. It's my simile of the snake. When I was staying over in Thailand in these forest monasteries, there was hardly many monasteries which had electricity. But they had lots of snakes, and I was told that of the hundred species of snake in that part of Thailand, 99 were venomous. If they bit you, you're in big trouble. And the hundredth species of snake would strangle you to death. In other words, every one of those snakes was dangerous. And so sometimes in those early days, we didn't have flashlights or we didn't have uh, batteries for the flashlight or they were really 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 weak 
and often you didn't have any slippers to walk back from the, the hall to your hut in the evening. So often you were walking barefoot with hardly any light, knowing there were these dangerous snakes. <laughs> I did that to wake you up because it's in the evening. <laughs> And if they and the snakes had bad vision too, so they saw my toe, they would think it's like a nice juicy worm. So you had to be careful. So I never got bitten, and one of the reasons I say was because if I left the hall, going back to my hut, and it was uh, late at night, and I didn't have a strong flashlight, I would really be on the lookout for the snakes on the path. I made a special attention to make sure that if I saw a shadow on the path, I didn't know whether it was a stick or whether it was a snake. So I'd either stop and go another path or just jump over it very quickly. But I was not heedless when I knew the danger of snakes. And that's why I never got bitten. And also, that that's what I use for meditation. I had you know, some of those problems which you experience from time to time. In this particular case, like if anger is your main problem. Why do you get anger? Where does it come from? You trace it back earlier and earlier and earlier. The first little irritation, blaming somebody, thinking they're in your way, or thinking they're frustrating you. Take it earlier and earlier and earlier. And you find when anger is very, at its beginnings, it's easy to stop. Just like a fire in the forest, if you catch it, when it's you know, the first little flames start to come up, you can douse it very quickly. If you wait too long, then the fire is so strong in the forest, you need the fire brigade to put it out, if it can do that at all. Catching it early. Or just like you have a tree which is growing in your garden. You can cut out, take out a tree by your hand, just put it out when it's a tiny sapling. But when it gets to be this huge tree, you've left it alone too long, it's impossible to take out. So this is why catching it early, being mindful that this is a problem, catching it early, and then you can overcome it. And also, I'll use this opportunity, any problems you have in your meditation, like you get afraid sometimes, you see a light in the mind or something and your heart starts beating really fast, how can you overcome that problem? If that is a common problem for you, it happens you know, every retreat a few times, and it stops you enjoying the deeper states of meditation, at the beginning of your meditation, you do what I call programming your mindfulness. At the beginning of the meditation, you settled into your position, you got your eyes closed, and you tell yourself, if I get afraid in the meditation, I will be courageous, I'll just let it be. If I get afraid, I will just be courageous. If I get afraid, I will just be courageous. Or whatever words you want to instruct yourself, say that at the beginning. And then what happens, you know, you're meditating, and then just nice experiences come, but they're a bit much for you, you start getting fear. That program will then kick in. It's like an antivirus on your computer. You've already programmed it in, and when it's needed, it'll just turn up. And you just get a bit of fear coming up, and then this word will come up, be courageous. You don't know where it comes from, actually. Afterwards, you know where it came from. You programmed it in at the beginning of your meditation. And this is very, very powerful. I teach this, I do it myself, and it works so, so well. Dear Ajahn, after the walking meditation, can I immediately do sitting meditation? Of course. I noticed that my leg knee not so painful after the walking meditation. Great. 
and while sitting meditation is more comfortable. Marvelous. Appreciate your advice. Thank you. Well done. <laughs> now you can see here that I'm the last monk who will be a control freak. If that's happening, wonderful. Experiment, see if it works. If it works for you, great, keep on doing it. It may not work for other people, but if it works for you, well done. And that's how the Buddha would uh, advise. He said one of the advantages of walking meditation, it gets your body relaxed and your mind peaceful, so you can go and sit down and do some nice meditation. One of these monks I met many, many, many years ago, uh, he wasn't that famous, but his story was that he just happened to be doing some business. He was just a farmer, but doing something uh, in the town of Sukonakon when Ajahn Man's funeral was being held. And so he just wondered what the heck's going on there. So many monks. He went to go and listen to one of the sermons. And in this talk, the monks said, all you really need to do is to sit a lot and walk a lot. Sitting meditation and walking meditation. This guy was a simple farmer. That's what he remembered. And so he did ordain. He renounced, became a monk. And that's all he ever did. He would be on his walking meditation path. If he got tired, he'd sit on his walking meditation path. And then he'd get up and carry on walking. This was like in sand. You know, he was like a farmer. You know, the people weren't used to comfort if you work on the farm in the poor parts of northeast Thailand. And the reputation was that he got fully enlightened. But he didn't really teach very much. But then one time, one of the other monks uh, was just was just chatting with him and asked, and where do you come from? said, Australia. Where's that? Down south. How far south? A long way down south. And if you go any further from Australia, you get to Antarctica. And Antarctica is full of ice. And this monk, he was only a farmer, didn't do much school, said, Ice, just a land just full of ice everywhere. It was kind of unbelievable to a simple farmer who'd had very little education. But anyway, we had conversations like that. And the following morning, he told us, monk, yes, you're right. I went there last night. It was very cold. <laughs> and this guy was too simple to lie. So, you know, he had some, some powers in him, and that's the sort of stuff he did to check out, you know, how cold Antarctica is. He didn't need aircraft. Anyway, a lot of gratitude for the guidance. Would you describe the meditation you are teaching as similar to Shikanta's Zen tradition? No, I wouldn't. I wouldn't describe it at all. I just teach it. You don't compare these things. Do, do nothing meditation here. One is asked to drop any object that comes into the field of awareness. No, you don't drop any object. You don't do anything. You just let this moment be with beautiful kindness. The kindness there was missing from the Zen tradition. That's why I still, I went to one of these Zen monasteries when I was a lay person up in the north of England. It's still apparently open and it was called Throstle Hole Priory in the north of England and it's the first time I'd ever been on a Zen retreat and sure enough there's only about 20 or 25 of us and so they had a hall and we were told to sit uh, facing the wall with our eyes open and there was a passage between us and that's where the Zen master who was an American monk, he came with the Zen stick and walking behind us, you couldn't see him, so it's a little bit scary. But you know, I must have been a really good meditator because I never got hit with a stick, never. You know why? Because the meditator sitting next to me got hit with a stick 
and that scared me so much. I was very mindful. <laughs> but it kind of shocked me, because why do people do those things? That is not the way to overcome sloth and torpor, through fear. But one of the things which I did notice at that retreat was there's only two days, a weekend retreat, and this is one of the fascinating parts. Now, it was quite a sacrifice for me to go to that retreat because the same weekend there was like a concert by the Rolling Stones. And it was either go to the Rolling Stone concert or go to a retreat. That's just how great an act of renunciation it was. <laughs> but anyhow, uh, so I went on this retreat and just with your eyes open, just watching a wall, a simple wall, just whitewash, you know, no, uh, that, you know that, that kind of color or white color, but no sort of hangings on it, no ornaments on it, just a plain white wall. Now one of the things I've already told you is that I know how to be mindful, even then, how to be in the present moment, how to not have any commentary, and not to expect anything. So I wasn't thinking about past or future or anything. I wasn't thinking, what am I supposed to do? Because there was no instructions. Just sit there, eyes open, watch the wall. And then the wall vanished. It disappeared. Now, many people would get scared. Your eyes are still open, but you're not seeing anything. I was a bit crazy, but at least at that time in the culture of UK, the late 60s, early 70s, at that time anything weird was really cool. <laughs> and so I thought, wow, this is great, a wall has vanished. And I wasn't taking any drugs or being crazy at all, I was just looking there and the wall vanished. And that taught me a great insight, which was, even with sight, with your eyes open, if what you're seeing doesn't move, if it's still, you pay attention to it, it disappears. Your brain is only wired to notice things which change. Even sound. Now I'm aware of the sound of the aircon behind me. In a few seconds I won't be aware of it at all. It doesn't change. It's what they call ambient sound. And now I was seeing ambient sight. A whitewashed wall which didn't move and didn't change. So after a few seconds, actually more like 20 minutes, that wall just disappeared. My brain didn't register it anymore. And it taught me just how stillness, when things don't move, is the cause for things vanishing. So, you are, close your eyes when you meditate. You see the inside of your eyelids, first of all. You're so used to that, you probably don't even notice it now. And your sense of sight turns off. If people are reasonably silent, and after a time, the sense of sound turns off. Smell, as long as people haven't got digestive problems, the smell is the same. It's one of the reasons why, if people pass too much wind, please sit on the back. If you sit in the front, then so many people behind you <laughs> can smell. <laughs> and so it disturbs them. I won't be rude, because I was going to say that's why people here sit in the back. No, I can't say that. <laughs> but if the smell doesn't change, it turns off. Your taste in your mouth turns off. 
And one of the hardest things to turn off is your sense of physical touch. There's always something irritating you there. Often when I say this, I ask people to just to look at the people in this hall like I'm looking at you. How many of you can keep still without moving? You, know, you brush your hair, you scratch your nose, your ears, sorry. You know, scratch the, the thigh. You lift your head up and move it around. You're just holding your knees or your, um, yes, your knees are on the back somewhere. Someone else was brushing their hair by the ear. I'm describing what I'm seeing right now. How many of you can sit motionless and not move at all? It's very difficult because the body is always demanding attention. We get to the point where you can sit still and then, yeah, you do get ambient feelings in the body, but you don't respond to them. And then the feelings in the body vanish. Imagine that. You can't see anything, you can't hear anything. You can't smell, taste or touch anything. Your five senses have turned off. Bliss. You'd be surprised at how pleasant that feels. When the five senses just leave you alone. And they're just taking a rest. Even in sleep. People just move backwards and forwards. And people don't have deep sleep because you know, they, they hear noises or whatever. But in meditation, you can be totally still. So that you can't hear, you can't feel the body. This is one gentleman many years ago. This is why I always don't finish the questions. But too many stories. He was... <laughs> He was got a job, it's basically the only thing he could do. He came from a very poor family in the British Army. And he was doing manoeuvres over in Germany. Uh, but he always suffered from migraines. And so if he had a migraine and he was on some sort of operations, that he would tell his troops, he was like a sergeant, tell his soldiers, just you know, have a cup of tea for a quarter of an hour, and he was going to go into the nearest dark place he could find, usually an old uh, barn on a farm, and just sit there, because in the darkness, he could actually settle his migraine. But he didn't really know what he was doing, and when he told me what he was up to, it was fascinating, because he would go, he said, inside the migraine, and he couldn't feel it at all. But to show how much he didn't feel, on one occasion, he was in the barn, going inside, and then the, uh, the order came over the radio, you've got to move to another destination. So all the soldiers packed up their tea things and started moving to the different destination until one of them remembered, we haven't got our sergeant. He stood in the barn. So they you know, reverse went to the barn. They saw him sitting there. They told him to come on, we've got to go. He couldn't hear them. So the soldiers lifted him up and put him in the back of the truck. Now soldiers are not the most delicate of people. So it must have been rough picking him up and bunging him in the back of the truck. That's what they did. And then he came out of his whatever he was doing afterwards. What am I doing in the back of the truck? I was in the barn. Yeah, we, we, we picked you up and put you in here. And that's when he realized that that was those deep meditations where the five senses disappear. It was a wonderful time inside. And later on, he's passed away now. But later on in his life, he got rid of the migraines. And he regrets. It's nice not having migraines, but he misses <laughs> The ability to get to the deep meditations. <laughs> At least he had a taste of what it can do. And then those deep meditations. If any of you get into a deep meditation and uh, it's the retreat is over, it doesn't matter. We'll just pick you up and we'll take you back to Sasnaraka. And you can come out of meditation there. <laughs> 
that's how it happens. All good stuff. Anyway, let's see what else is in here. That's only oh, four questions done. Go to this one. Oh yeah. I feel doubt arise in me as I keep questioning. Why bother pursuing Nibbana? Why can't we remember past lives in view of non-self? How should I deal with this? you got no choice. You think you're in control. You think you can choose what you're going to pursue or you're not going to pursue. After a while, when you listen to good monks or good nuns teach. I admit this, I'm honest with you, you get brainwashed. For many of you, you've been on my retreats too often. There's no way back. Now honestly, sometimes, you know, I th thought like that, why do I have to be in the northeast of Thailand and just, you know, not have much sleep, have all these animals crawling all over you, you know, the uh, not just snakes, you know, crawl over you, and the centipedes and uh, all sorts of stuff, and just have really terrible food, and it was terrible food, have to work very hard. Why am I doing this for? But then when you were practicing with a monk like a Ajahn Chah, there was something about what you saw was just you know, so attractive. It didn't really matter just how hard it was, how ascetic it was. You couldn't leave it. And many people, even in Australia, say this. They say, once you start hearing about the Dhamma, really good Dhamma, you know, about deep meditation and deep insight, you can't forget it. Some people, they go away for a couple of years you see them coming back again. So why bother pursuing Nibbana when we can't remember past lives? You will remember past lives and sometimes you may not remember them explicitly. But there's something you know, in you know, your experience. You cannot explain that other than there's something from a past life is driving you. Look at my experience. I was a young man born in London. None of my relations were Buddhist. And as I mentioned, I think in a talk a couple of days ago, none of my relations could even spell Buddhism. And how did it happen? That the only person in the family who eventually got interested in Buddhism became a monk. Me, how on earth could that happen? You can't just say chance. There must be something from a previous life. You just can't resist it. Why I became a monk? It's a crazy thing to do. I had a very good education. I could have got a really good job, and I could have, I could have retired by now. <laughs> Now look at me. So the answer is, you got no choice. So just just take it. You have to pursue the bottom. It's too late. Ah, here we go. I think it's from the little kid. Where's he gone? Why the Buddha live forever? Why are there wars? Why monks no hair? Why monk and the Buddha wear robes? So, why does the Buddha live forever? Because a Buddha is not a person. You can see a Buddha over there. Hello. Oh, it's over there. Hi. Your questions. The Buddha is not a person. It's what the Buddha represents. And that what it represents, virtue, peace and compassion, that always exists. People come and go, but those principles which the Buddha stands for, they live forever. Why are there wars? 
These people don't pursue nibbana, they pursue other things instead. And wars are just crazy ideas which meant that people want to control territory. Who owns territory? Does the BGF own this temple where we're meditating? We don't need to own it. We can make use of it. And it's only when we want to own more temples, more land, more things, that's when people have wars. And it's crazy, but at least please don't you have any wars. Why monks no hair? Because we, we can't afford like a hairbrush. Or a comb. You know, it's really hard when you have hair. I'm really sure. How many times do you have to wash it? And sometimes, as somebody's brother, it gets grey and you want to dye it. For monks, it's so easy having no hair. When you don't have any hair, you stand under the shower and you wash your hair at the same time. In a Malaysia, in KO, how much does it cost? So, you know, to go to the, the hairdressers, the hairstylists. It's a lot of money. Can you really afford to go to a hairstylist to make your hair look nice? Razor blades are very cheap. Because I'm going to have to shave my hair in a few days' time, somebody got me a pack of razor blades. I've got a few spare. If anybody wants a razor blade, it's very, very cheap. <laughs> so anyway, you know, why do people have their hairstyles? It's only just because you know what our culture and society expect of us. But being bald is cool. Very cool sometimes. It's <laughs> very cold. <laughs> it's nice. And why monk and a Buddha wear robes? I did mention this, I think, which talk was it? I think it was in the BGF. Because I travel so much before and these days, people were uh, concerned. Because there was a time uh, when people actually, I think it was an MH flight, uh, flying over Ukraine or somewhere, and they got shot down. And there was actually a Singapore Airlines flight just right behind. I usually travel Singapore Airlines. The people said, you better stop flying on the aircraft to go to Europe or London or anywhere. I said, I've got it all figured out. If when I'm flying over that part of the world that somebody tries to shoot me down and the aircraft explodes, then this robe becomes my parachute. It's really big. You hold the four corners and then you flow down safely to the ground. One of the reasons we wear robes because a long time ago, two and a half thousand years ago, it was a simple form of clothing. It's, you know, it's a rectangular sheet which you wrap around you. And honestly, it is usually my preferred bed sheet. If I'm cold in the evening, I just use a robe. I've never been able to, honestly, it's a weird thing, I've never been able to sleep under dunas. I don't know why, because I never had dunas when I was a kid. A blanket, maybe, if you're really cold, but a duna, no way. You feel really uncomfortable. So anyway, that's why we wear bed sheets, because they are bed sheets. Hi Ajahn Brahm, it's me again. Go on, check my handwriting with the registration. <laughs> Is there a definite original cause for the disturbance of the default state of the mind? Yes. Wanting. Wanting disturbs the default state of the mind. When you don't want anything, when you're contented and perfectly satisfied, not proud or demanding in nature, 
as we chanted this morning, as we're going to chant again tomorrow. It's called brainwashing, that's why we do the chanting. <laughs> then the mind doesn't get defaulted, it just stays still. You can soon see the truth of that. The disturbance of the first mind is not a first mind. I don't know why people are always talking about the first mind. If there was a first mind, there was the mind before the first mind, and the mind before the first mind. is zero mind, minus one mind, minus two mind. Or is it just random perturba perturbation that caused disturbance? No, it's just all wanting. When there's no wanting, there's no disturbance. Ajahn, is bhavana vipassana the same as reflection on dhamma? I mean, each time when I reflect on my practicing vipassana. Don't give it names, because if you start going into what's vipassana, what's samatha, what's bhavana, that's where people get into arguments. No need to call it a name. You are reflecting on dhamma, that's good. So leave it as reflecting on Dhamma. It leads to silence, to stillness, and it also leads to insight. Okay, here's a story. It's more than just um, insight and stillness. Many years ago, there were these couple. They lived together, uh, Sam and Vi. Uh, Sam, his full name was Sam Atta. And Vi's full name, she was Vi Pasana. And they were very happy together. And one day after lunch, they decided to go up on a walk up Meditation Mountain. They decided to take their two pets. They had two dogs. One dog was called Meta. The other dog was called Anapana. So Sam... Atta and Vai Pasana and their two dogs, Metta the dog and Anapana the dog. You know what Anapana means, don't you? That's a breath meditation. So anyway, they all went up um, Meditation Mountain. Now Sam went up um, the mountain because he loved the peace and the stillness up there. The higher you get up Meditation Mountain, the more still it is. And stillness by itself is so beautiful, so attractive. You know, there are times, you know, in some, like, especially caves, they're so silent, so still. You just, just want to stay there forever. Nothing disturbs you. So he went up there for the stillness. His partner, Vi, she went up there taking this big professional camera cost a fortune because she wanted to take some insight photos because the higher you get up <laughs> meditation mountain the further you can see meta the dog what did she go up there for because she enjoyed it sometimes I think dogs are wiser they can intuit the goodness of going up there without philosophizing about it. Sema Anapana. So up they went, up meditation. They got halfway up, and halfway up, oh, it was so still up there. And so Sam was really enjoying the stillness. Oh. Vi was already taking shots on her camera because you could see such a distance. Met the dog. Oh, she was so happy up there, wagging her tail. Anapana Sati, she was kind of disappearing. <laughs> and when they got to the top of Meditation Mountain, Anapana, the breath, was nowhere to be found, but totally disappeared. Metta, she was enjoying the, the bliss, the joy up there so much. She was wagging her tail like it's going to fall off. But Meta the dog also had a pair of eyes that could admire the incredible view. Could also experience the stillness up there. Same with Sam. The stillness was incredible. 
but he had eyes you can see so much. Vi was taking incredible photographs of insight wherever it was to spread around her so clear, but she also paused to enjoy the stillness as well. Because on top of Meditation Mountain, stillness, insight, and it's really important I included this one, meta, joy, happiness, bliss, that also lives up there as well. You cannot separate them. Insight, stillness, and bliss coexist. And I like that uh, inclusion of bliss, loving kindness, because sometimes people come up to me and say, you had this great meditation, that great insights, and sometimes, just to check them out, I look at their facial expression. There's no happiness there. Oh yeah, I understand the Dhamma now, I understand non-self, I understand this. Under they say that with a, like a horizontal mouth, and I think that maybe they haven't really understood it. If they say, oh, they're so still. Oh, it's so wonderful, there's no self. Oh. If there is the afterglow of wisdom and freedom, the joy, then okay, maybe you've got something. And I've been in this business a long time. Many people deceive themselves. Next question, how do you know if you're in a deep meditative state and not just falling asleep? You use the word deep meditative state yesterday. How many states are there? <laughs> There's, I use the word deep meditative states because sometimes uh, if you start talking about the jhanas and the immaterial states, some people don't really know what you're talking about. Some people think they know what you're talking about, but they don't. So you're talking about stuff where the mind is very, very peaceful and bliss and very aware. If in those types of states, you don't know where you are inside of them. The mind has got no width. To be able to see something, what about what's in front of me here? Now as I'm looking in now, it's too close for me to actually to see it. I know it's a microphone because I've seen it before. I stand back, look at it this way, look at it that way. Oh yeah, it's a microphone. You need perspective to understand what a thing really is. You have to be able to move. And so, because of that, that inside a, a meditative state, you know you're having a great time, really blissed. But you don't know exactly what it is until you come out. Each one of these states is very, very, very powerful. Because they are powerful, they leave an indelible imprint in your mind to the point that uh, you can recall it so easily. And this is actually how you know which state it was. You certainly know you were in these deep meditative states. As far as being asleep is concerned, you know afterwards when you come out of your meditation, that wasn't a deep meditation. Because your mind has not got this energy, this clarity. Because it says in the Nala Kapana Sutta, it's one of my favorite sayings, if you've entered a jhana, when you come out afterwards, the five hindrances have gone for a long time, together with Arati, which means discontent, and Tandi, weariness. You got your energy back. And you can't have discontent. You're so blissed out. And you don't have any of the hindrances. No sloth and torpor, no doubt. And no desire or ill will left. I just remember, I don't know if I said it here. I think I might have said it to the monks at breakfast or something. I say, if anybody asks, you know, come out to me and said they got a jhana, just come out of jhana, one of the girls here. And I say, oh, I, sorry, I should have told you that Malaysian women can't get into jhana. 
and I wait to see their reaction. <laughs> they say, Ajahn Brahm, you can't say that. If that's how they react, then that's true, it wasn't a jhana. You say, okay, fair enough. And it doesn't affect you. There's no ill will, there's no negativity towards me. Then, okay, fine, that probably was. You see if a person has a reaction, because after a jhana, there's no reaction at all. Just totally at peace. Do I react to a silly monk saying stupid things? <laughs> Do you understand that? And that's actually how you know the difference between being asleep and being in a deep meditation. The after effects of a deep meditation. Wow. Saw your face. Oh, saw your. Hey, saw your face. Because oh, here we go. I'm just getting the the writing. I think there was some maybe negativity because of the words. Saw your face become monkey god. Oh, monkey god. Fair through projector screen sometimes become bodhisattva face also. So you saw me, you perceived me become the monkey god or the bodhisattva. Actually because of my nature and being a bit sort of uh, playful, I think monkey god. I think I prefer that one. Which is the true one? You can actually see what's happening there is your perceptions can add and subtract whatever you're actually you're seeing. You can interpret it so many different ways. And this is again something which happens in meditation. That when I was a monk quite a few years in Thailand, one of the weird things which happened was that I was passing the of the place where the monks would bathe in the afternoon, next to the well. And there was a towel on the line. And that towel was a color black. Like black as a piece of coal. And in all my life I'd never seen a black colored towel. It wasn't dirty, it was actually black, like it had been dyed black like it was something which people wear at funerals. But it was a towel. And I stopped. It was the middle of the day. Stared at it for about five minutes. And after five minutes, that towel turned white color. And I was not imagining. I was not crazy. I just had some deep meditation. And my mind was just showing just how interpretations, perceptions can mess around and change. And seeing that sometimes in the suttas, the Buddha said that during the day you can perceive it like at night time, during the night time perceive it as daytime. Your mind is conditioned to see things in one particular way and now because of the meditation, you become free to see things in other ways. See a white towel as black. It's weird stuff, but it's quite fascinating. As long as you don't get scared, you can see weird stuff, which is fascinating. You're not such a prisoner of the perceptions which have been imprinted into you by your conditioning and your education. Okay, another uh, set of questions asked by a uh, little kid in the back. What is enlightenment? Okay, how to achieve enlightenment? After we are enlightened, what will we become? Which is the greatest? Which is the, the who greatest? The Buddha. How to become the greatest Buddha? Okay. To answer those questions, it's a story I always tell on these retreats. 
It's the best explanation I've ever heard about what is enlightenment and how to be enlightened. And that's the story of the five children playing the wishing game. I hope you've heard that before because it's one of my fam favorite and also the, some of the best story. Five children were playing a wishing game. The rules went like this. Every child had a wish and the child who came up with the best wish would win the game. So the first child said, I wish for a new Nintendo. Because he liked playing computer games. Fair enough. The next child said, if I had a wish, I would wish for a computer game shop. Then I can have many computer games. And if I own a shop, I can have the next best computer game which comes up. Fine. The second child is winning. The third child, she was really intelligent. She said, if I had a wish, I would wish for $10 billion US. Not ring it. Because <laughs> with $10 billion US, I can buy my own computer game shop. But then the problem is that if I'm playing computer games, my mummy keeps telling me to do my homework first. So then I will buy my own school. If I own the school and I pay the salaries to the teachers and the principal, then if they tell my mommy I'm not doing my homework, I'll sack them. And when I graduate from my own school, then I can actually buy my own university and give myself an honorary degree. That's what Ajahn Bamali got recently, but I don't think... Yeah, the university. <laughs> and with an honorary degree, I can, I can have all the, the qualifications my mother wants me to have. And at the same time, I can play computer games all day and all night. <coughs> with $10 billion US, then whatever else I need. And I can also tell my mummy what she needs. I can buy for her, so she'll always be very happy with me which means that I can have a wonderful life playing computer games all day and all night. The best wish so far. But there's two more children. And both those children did outdid the $10 billion US wish. The fourth child said, if I had a wish, I would wish for three wishes. That's a wish. So for my first wish, I'll have the computer game shop. My second wish, I'll have $10 billion US. And for my third wish, I will have three more wishes. That way, I can go on forever. Beat that. So the fourth kid had an infinity of wishes granted. And the fifth child was a very quiet boy. And he said, if I had a wish, I wish I was so content I never needed a wish ever again. That's enlightenment. So content, you never needed any more wishes. Which surpasses the infinity of wishes granted. People who want an infinity of wishes granted, they're the people who become politicians. Prime ministers and presidents and dictators. They've already got lots of money, but they need to have more power to have the infinity of wishes granted. The people like the third kid, $10 billion US, that's wealthy people. But even wealthy people can't get what they want. That's where they join politics. That's where you get the wars from. The wisest of all those people, the last, so content, you never needed any wishes ever again. Next question. In Mahayana teachings, devotees are urged to return 
lives after lives to perfect their paramis and aim to be the Buddha to save innumerable beings, not to stop at arahatship. Since everyone has the potential and Buddha nature, Gautama had gone through the path, hence so can others. Is it plausible and persuasive argument suggestion would silly like your views and perspective? So, first of all, whenever I do sutta classes and like read, you know, some of the sutta descriptions of what happens with the Buddha, there's one sutta, which I think you may know, if not, have a look at it. It's called the Gatikara Sutta in the Majjhima And there the Buddha was walking with his attendant Ananda and he smiled at a particular place and then the Buddha said that I smiled at this place because in this place there lived the previous Buddha Kasapa and the previous Buddha Kasapa is said to have lived in this what they call the fortunate eon in other words not that long ago and he said that Kasapa the Buddha had a chief disciple, layman, called Gatikara. Gatikara was a poor man because uh, he had two parents who were both blind. And even though he would have loved to ordain under Kasapa the Buddha, he was forced to stay at home to look after his parents. But his conduct, he was supposed to be was declared to be a non-returner, but his conduct was well worth letting you know that he was a potter, but he would, he would never dig the earth in case he would kill any little worm or beetle or something in the ground. He would wait until somebody else had some leftover clay and that's what he would use to make his pots. And he would not sell his pots. When he'd made those pots and they were completed, he put them on a shelf outside his hut with a sign saying, whoever wants a pot, please help yourself and take it. If you would like to leave some rice and some beans, please leave them but he would never have any money at all. And that's one of the things which I was really impressed with. Even as a lay person, of course he was a non-returner, he wouldn't have any money or any dealings with money. And then, Gatikara had a best friend called Jyotipala. And he always was trying to get his best friend Jyotipala to go and see Kasapa the Buddha. But Jyotipala was not interested in spirituality at all. Whenever he was asked to go and see the castle of the Buddha, why would I want to see the castle of the bald-headed, hopeless guy? And he would actually say bad words about castle of the Buddha. And then one day, that Gatikara was just so intent on getting his best friend to meet the Buddha, he tried all sorts of tricks and eventually he just grabbed Jyotipala by the hair and tried to pull him towards the monastery. And putting someone by the hair in many cultures is such a no-no, you're just not supposed to touch the head of such people. And so Jyotipala said, do you go to such an extreme to make me go and see Kasapa the Buddha? And Gatikara said, yes. I know it's offensive to you to pull your hair, but that's how far I need to go to get you to see Kasapa the Buddha. So Jyotipala went. And Jyotipala was impressed because Kasapa the Buddha gave them a sermon. And afterwards, when they left, Jyotipala said, Gatikara, my best friend, why don't you go and ordain under Kasapa the Buddha? And then Gatikara said, look, because my parents are blind. I have to look after them. Okay, said Jyotipala, I will ordain then. 
and Jyotipala became a monk under Kasapa the Buddha. And after telling that story and a few other things, the Buddha said, I was Jyotipala. That's a previous life of Siddhartha Gautama the Buddha. Not that long ago. And he called Kasapa bad names. The idea of parami is very dodgy. Such a short time ago, Gotama, who became our Buddha, couldn't even recognize a Buddha when he was so close by. And also, what I also like is that uh, I usually bring in another sutta from the, I think it's just, yeah, it's in Samyutta Nikaya. The Gatikara goes to see Gotama the Buddha. Gatikara is now living in the Sudawasa. That's where non returners get, I won't say reborn, they re arise there. So there, that's Gatikara. Gatikara was a non-returner there and Gatikara came down to see the Buddha, our Buddha, Gautama the Buddha, to congratulate him. Well done, you're a Buddha now. And also to tell the Buddha some nice news. Now three or four of Buddha Gautama's disciples had got reborn in the Sudawasa and very quickly had attained full enlightenment and disappeared from there. And straight away, Buddha Gautama said, how do you know that? That's where I live now. But before, we lived in the same village and I was, uh, I was your best friend. And it was reinforcing the fact that these two beings, Gatikara and uh, Siddhartha Gautama, best friends in the previous life, now, Siddhartha Gautama was our Buddha, and Gatikara was in the realm of the non returners. Check it out for yourself. The thing is also, you need to emphasize that once a person becomes enlightened, they're fully enlightened, they're an arahat, they still teach. They teach for many years. And using the metaphor in Buddhism of the Dharma wheel, the Buddha sets the Dharma wheel in motion. Once the Buddha passes, to, passes away, Gotama the Buddha passed away how long ago? You know, it's over two and a half thousand years ago. But nevertheless, the wheel of the Dhamma still continues to move very powerfully all the way to Malaysia, where it's strong, all the way to Australia, where it's strong, even to Mexico. <laughs> and so many other countries. But the Buddha passed away, disappeared. And it's still very strong. Buddhas are needed to start that Dhamma wheel. The Arahats keep it in motion. And 2,500 years after the Buddha passed away, the Dhamma is still strong and even spreading to so many countries. That's how we keep these things spreading. Once a person becomes enlightened, they teach, inspire, spread the Dhamma. But more importantly, that once a person becomes enlightened, they create many other enlightened beings. So that when they die, and pass away Paranibbana, there'll be others to carry on the teaching. As long as there are our huts in the world, then Buddhism will grow stronger and stronger. 
That's the purpose of having our hands. Ajahn Brahm, how do I overcome boredom in meditation? I'm so used to being stimulated most of the time and being in the doing mode. Oh, it's so easy. Look, just reflect on the benefits of being in meditation. For the next six or seven days, you don't have to go to work. Yay! All you women with husbands, you don't have a husband to serve and to get angry at. <laughs> all you guys, you're free of all the household responsibilities. You don't have any kids, you know, to have to, I don't know what you do with the kids. It's a very good idea being your kid here. You don't, apparently, you don't have to do any washing up either. All the food is cooked for you and people wash up for you. It's bliss. How can you be bored? Ah, sometimes when it gets to the end of the retreat, you just don't want to go home. You don't want to stay here forever. <laughs> so, but when you are watching the breath, don't just go doing things like watch the breath, breathing in, breathing out, breathing in, breathing out. How long do I have to do this? Give it some oomph. It's just the same way that when we do that chanting in the morning, at the very end of the chanting, what do you do? You don't just do sad and sad and sad. You give it full energy. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Is that boring? It's actually what you add to what you're doing makes it boring or interesting. And after a while, with the meditation, it becomes the most amazing, joyful, incredible thing you can ever do in your whole existence. The bliss, the joy, the interest which you get is enormous. That's why, we've only just started the retreat, there will come the time, at lunchtime there will be a couple of people sitting up here, they don't want to go to lunch. They're having too much fun being here. It's too joyful. Too much happiness. And this is actually shows you just what's possible in the meditation. Huge. And the idea of being bored in the meditation. But anyway, if you do have boredom, because you know, you're used to being stimulated by outside things rather than stimulating yourself, you can try stimulating yourself by doing something like this. You know that in psychology, boredom is not studied enough. So if you feel bored, get a piece of paper and please do an investigation into what boredom feels like. What causes it? And when it does come, how do you feel it in your body? What part of your body registers boredom? How do you know you're bored? What's its characteristics? How does boredom develop over the minutes after the, you know, the time you're there? What else does it do to your body? Does it stop you getting hungry? Does it stop you really being able to listen to another person? Does it stop you thinking? What are the qualities and the effects of boredom? Once you start doing this, you'll find a very interesting fact. The boredom is one of the most fascinating subjects you can think about. <laughs> and straight away you change boredom to being something interesting. Boredom is just a lack of engagement with what you're doing in the present moment. And when you add this beautiful kindness to the meditation, you don't get bored. It's fascinating what you can do. And sicknesses, you know, you can heal yourself. You get those hot spots in your body. You get, like this one lady, during the meditation, she's getting nice and peaceful. But then somebody actually uh, alerted me, said, come have a look at her. She was all twisted around. And she was, I can't actually say exactly what she looked like, because you'd have to take me to hospital. It was just really contorted. 
and afterwards, when she came out of the meditation, I told her, I said, Madam, just during that meditation, your body was just really twisted, so incredibly bad. Are you okay? And her response was, I feel wonderful. And I thought, stupid Ajahn Brahm, you should have known. When did you have that accident? She was also in a very bad car accident. She was lucky to come out alive. And I realized what was happening. When you meditate, you're letting go, being kind. And her body, for the first time, was allowed to twist around so that the healing energy could go to those parts which were needed. There's amazing things happening in meditation. Or, especially for the young kid in the back, this was one monk I knew. He was the Indonesian monk. I've mentioned him before. He's passed away now, Novenal Sudama. Did you ever meet him? Okay, no, just the Indonesian girl behind him. But anyway, I met him a couple of times. He was a very, very powerful meditator. And anyway, he started teaching meditation in Wat Bawan. You know, one day a week. And I remember just one of my friends, lay friends, who used to go there every week to listen to him. And she was a woman that I would trust, would never exaggerate or lie. She said in one of his classes, like here, we were meditating together, that she felt there's something weird going on, like electricity in the air. She opened her eyes and she saw clearly uh, that this monk had his light beams coming out of his eyes going into one of these other meditators. The monk with laser eyes. And this wasn't a Hollywood uh, in heart, was it visual enhancement or whatever it's called? This was real. If you don't find that fascinating, you're weird. <laughs> so some of the stuff which happens in meditation is really just amazing. Or, if you get bored in the meditation, sorry. See if you can get to reasonably deep meditations and before you come out, ask yourself, what is my earliest memory? See if you can get your past lives. That happens. A reasonably deep meditation you feel you've got energy in your mind. This pause. You ask that question and see what happens. And if you're lucky, you remember who you were before. Is that boring? No way. Answers a lot of questions. And this is not imagination, because if it really is a deep meditation, the fifth hindrance of doubt is overcome. And what you experience, you experience it without doubt. You know that was you. Total certainty, like you don't have certainty with many, many things. Even the certainty, what did you have for lunch today? You kind of know. But you're not that certain, you make mistakes. But with these memories, it's 100%. Okay, next question. I always read about a scam involving beggars. Should I give money to beggars? Yes. We monks are beggars, aren't we? <laughs> but don't give money to us. Put it in the donation box. There was this story which I heard. There was in an, an Indian temple. There was a beggar outside the temple. And this rich man had just gone in to do his chanting or praying, whatever he was doing. And when the rich man came out, the beggar said, can you please give me uh, some donation? And the rich man said, no, you know, I've worked for all my money. It's really hard work. I've strived. I stayed up late at night. I learned a lot. So, you know, if you want money, you should earn it. And the beggar said, um, excuse me. Well, what did you go to the temple for? 
you went in that temple to beg from your God to make you more prosperous. I'm not begging from a God, I'm just begging from you. Same thing. <laughs> so how many times have you bowed to a Buddha statue or to some monk or something to ask for your cancer gets uh, less or you get much more prosperity or whatever else? Isn't that begging? Aren't you all beggars? <laughs> There's so much truth to that. So after a while, if somebody needs some money, you've got some, just give. It's a lovely thing to do. Whenever we do chanting, can you please chant? Some people ask me to chant for people who are sick. Sometimes the chanting works. It's weird. I remember just one of these occasions, I went, I was called up to Royal Perth Hospital, to the ICU unit, because there was a family there, the, uh, the head of their family, who's very old, was dying. He was in the ICU, been unconscious for many hours. And all the family had come from different parts of the world, a Chinese family, from different parts of the world to be with the, their grandfather, their senior a member of their family, at the very last. And so they asked me, they rang up the monastery, please, 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 can you come just to do some chanting? So I went there, and my mistake, I do make mistakes, my mistake was I just didn't ask them. It was just a rush, it was, you know, the guy was dying. So I didn't ask them exactly what the situation was. But I went inside the ICU, started doing my Buddhist chanting. And sometimes I can really be powerful. And so as I was doing the chanting, the guy actually opened his eyes, came out of the coma. And I thought, wow, this is incredible. And then when I went into the waiting room to tell the relations, you know, your father, uncle, whatever it was, is gonna survive for a little while. They were so angry at me. Many had taken time off work from their busy businesses to be with the leader, their patriarch, one last time. And they said they'd even arranged a funeral service. Now because of this smart Alec monk called Ajahn Brahm, they'd have to cancel the funeral service, go back to Taiwan, Hong Kong, or wherever they were from, knowing they'd have to come back in six months and do it all over again. And I said, well, you didn't tell me what chanting you wanted. There are different chants. There's a get better soon chant or the die peaceful chant. It's not my fault I did the wrong chant. <laughs> and that was true. You know, they would usually, being Chinese tradition, they'd give an ang pao afterwards, which the driver would take home to monastery. No Ang Pao's. <laughs> I'm surprised they didn't send me a bill for all their travel expenses. <laughs> while, my, while my mind is relatively calm during meditation, I notice I've become a lot more aware of negative thoughts and emotions, especially of the past, that arises after meditation. What else can I do to deal with these thoughts and emotions? other than sending myself phrases of self-compassion and soothe these feelings. Send that compassion to those feelings and those thoughts. Compassion doesn't have to be to beings. I love extending this idea, may all living beings be happy and well. Sometimes I do that, may all lifts, all motherboards of lifts be happy and well. <laughs> It hasn't worked yet, but I'm still <laughs> Honestly, I do do that. <coughs> this, <laughs> have great fun, because sometimes it really does work. And <laughs> there was our youth group in Perth, and after doing you know, teaching them one Saturday evening, after the youth group was finished, I had to go off and do a quick bit of chanting in the neighbor's house. But they were going to get ready to go to the beach. You know, this was Perth in the summertime. 
and it's you know they're young people they were going to sort of carry on just chatting and whatever down by the beach but unfortunately their car the boot was locked and i think in the boot was actually the keys to the car or something like that so they're trying to open the boot of their car they're trying to open it for about an hour and they could not do it and they were thinking of you know, calling the RAC, but that would cost them money. The RAC is the, the, uh, that group you can join, Royal Automobile Association, whatever, Royal Automobile Club. They can come in times of difficulty. But then they saw me walking down the road. So said, Ajahn Brahm, Ajahn Brahm, please help. You know, we can't open the boot of the car. And the lady who asked me, you know, she will admit this, Ronnie, her name is. She was actually Indonesian, but she lives in Perth now. So Ronnie said, I can't open the car. I've been trying for the last 40 minutes or so. And I said, if I open the boot of the car, would you start the ceremony to become a bikuni? She said, yes because she didn't believe I could do it. They mean, really <laughs> try 40 minutes. <laughs> and honestly, I took the key, gave some loving kindness on the lock, turned the key, and opened straight away. <laughs> she was just so shocked. Ah, I've got to become a big hoodie. I don't really want to become a big hoodie, but you promised. But unfortunately, another, another member of that youth group was a lawyer. You know what lawyers are like. She said, yes, she promised to become a bikuni, but she never said when. <laughs> so she got out of the obligation. It was a lovely two stories. I had a good laugh. But honestly, sometimes you, know, you can do loving kindness to things as well. And when you do that, it sometimes blows your mind just what you can do. Anyway, okay, one of those other stories. It's, again, I don't finish all the questions, but I never do anyway, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> there was this um, Thai forest monk who um, he was going to visit San Francisco area. So the monk who met him at the airport, you know, straight away said, now can I just see your visa to make sure everything's okay? Because that was a time of you know, very strict homeland security in the United States. And you had to make sure that people's visas were there and in, in order. Otherwise, even the host could get in trouble. So this monk just showed him his Thai passport and the monk couldn't believe what he saw in that passport. The visa which this monk was holding was a diplomatic visa with no expiry dates. As long as he lived, he could come into the United States on a diplomatic visa. Like, what on earth did you get? How on earth did you get this visa? And I said, I don't know, just people gave it to me. He was a simple forest monk. He wasn't related to anybody imported. But he was a very good monk. And they inquired what the story was. And what the story was, that in a previous visit, he was visiting the Thai temple in Houston, Texas. And at that time, NASA the National Aeronautical and Space Agency was installing a big mainframe computer, the number cruncher for the whole organization. And as they were installing it, you know, as a state-of-the-art piece of equipment, they could not boot it up to get it to work. And they flew in first class 
every expert they could find in North America, because this was costing them millions every hour. None of them could fix it. This is a true story. One of the engineers there working in the computer room in NASA was a Thai man. And he said, if all the experts in North America can't fix it, perhaps it might be something supernatural. That's what he said. And he said, but I know the person who can fix it. There's this very good monk. It's right now in Houston. We can invite him in and just because at least with monks we don't charge anything. Just a cup of tea or a glass of water and that's all we get. We don't mind. <laughs> so they invited him in, got him the security clearance so he can get into the mainframe computer room. And he apparently did some chanting. He sat down and meditated. And after the meditation was finished, the computer worked perfectly. I'll tell you his name, it's Ajahn Jamnien. Jamnien, he's still alive. J-U-M-N-I-E-N. -E but anyway, that out of gratitude, they gave him this diplomatic visa for life. What else can you give a monk? I always think that was it really out of gratitude or was there some selfishness there? So this monk could come and visit them whenever they wanted him. <laughs> he already had a visa. He could fast track through everything. But that's a true story. The monk who fixed computers. Big ones. So please, if your computer doesn't work, Please don't give it to me. This is other wonderful monks. <laughs> See what they can do. Well, I love those stories. Uh, uh, apparently, he was great on the loving kindness meditation. So that's apparently what he did. He gave loving kindness to this machine. It worked. Ah, Ajahn Brahm. As a gay person, should I have and raise a kid? Uh, with my partner in an LGBT unfriendly environment like Malaysia. Would this be unwise and unfair to the kids? Thank you for your advice. It's, I don't know Malaysia that well, but I know if you were in Australia and asked that question, I said, yeah, sure, go ahead. It may be, I'm not quite sure what the situation is here, but what I do know, it's never unfair for a kid to have two dads. You know, there was that same conversation, a debate on a TV show in Australia recently. I think they called it Q&A. So is it wrong for two men to raise a kid? And somebody wrote in a very perceptive and sharp comment, well, even Jesus had two dads. You understand? Son of God and the son of Joseph. Yeah. I thought that was really quite sharp and funny. You may get into trouble with that, but anyway. <laughs> but of course, it really depends upon those the two parents. If those parents are loving and kind, they've got a very good, strong relationship, that's a very positive for the kid. And probably much better than if they have a husband and wife, man and woman, who don't have a good relationship together. I, pref I would certainly prefer the chances of that kid having a good relationship with two men or two women if they have a very strong, good relationship together, if they're kind, rather than having a dysfunctional man or wife family. But I can't really answer that question more than that because I don't know really what the situation is like in Malaysia and how it will change in the future. But even just, I did hear that in Singapore, that you know, they have softened the regulations 
uh, between gay relationships. So, I don't know, maybe just move to Singapore, if you can. Australia is no problem at all. Further to my suggestion, on my question yesterday, if my meditation remains the same over the years, does it mean I need to examine my renunciation, kindness and gentleness? You can always examine renunciation, kindness and gentleness. If your meditation remains the same, or it gets better, or it gets worse. There's always good things to do. But you'll find that over the long term, it always gets better. One of the stories, when I was a lay person, I cannot exactly remember when this occurred, but I remember the occasion when I was just having a cup of coffee in some cafe somewhere with a French man. That's why I really love the French, because, yeah. <laughs> Because he saved my meditation life, this guy. And I was, he was saying that he was meditating a lot. And I said, well, I used to meditate a lot. But I'd kind of lost it for a while. And he said, well, why don't you meditate now? I'm talking personal. And I said, well, you know, there's so many other things to do <coughs> in my life. And I said, my meditation wasn't really getting very far. And he said, what do you mean? Well, you know, I just can't see any progress. And he told me, at the end of every meditation you do, just pause for a few seconds and just really see if you become more peaceful, more aware, and more joyful, if your body was more relaxed. And so I started doing that after every meditation, just so checking what the result was. It was surprising <coughs> and so beneficial because I found out that nearly all meditations you made some progress, but I just wasn't watching it. I didn't see it. And I thought I was making no progress at all. I didn't have the big booms and, and big blisses coming up, but it's still always beneficial. And when I saw that, I realized that he was right. So I started meditating much more. So please, I thank France for keeping me as a meditator. <laughs> because sometimes we forget that we think the meditation is not getting us anywhere. But it always does. It's much better you meditated for half an hour or for an hour than you didn't meditate at all. I am new in meditation. Can you give a step-by-step -step instruction in the meditation, please? Yes. Easy. Close your eyes. Shut up. Don't think and be kind. It's just your attitude, what you do. Whatever happens, your kindness, your stillness, will take you into deeper and deeper wonderful states of meditation. And all the things which I talk about, like being able to remember past lives, or being able to cure your own cancers, being able to be not stressed out at all, not anxious, and all this other stuff, that will just come as a natural course. But I don't like giving too many step-by-step -step instructions, because what happens then, is people say, well, I'm on, I'm on step three, I can't get to step four. If you can't get to step four, just go straight to step five. In other words, let it be natural. And sometimes you can find your own steps. How do I get back to Perth when I leave Malaysia? What steps do I take? You know, sometimes you can get an aircraft which goes straight away you know, from KL to Perth, or sometimes you can go from KL to, to Los Angeles, and Los Angeles to, to New Zealand, and then New Zealand to Perth. Which is the best way? Depends what you have to do. So the step-by-step -step sometimes confuses people. Just learn what peace is, what peace feels like. And make sure that you grow in peace, you grow in kindness. And little by little, over those years, you grow in insight and wisdom. 
And if you can't see that, the people you live with, the people you work with, they can see that. Anyway, I'll give some more instructions and steps sort of later on, tomorrow. Is it encouraged to be vegetarian for meditation? Why so many Buddhists, Hindu ashrams practice vegetarianism? Is it okay to eat meat and meditate? How many meat eaters are there here? You know what other is? You know one of the reasons I eat meat? I was a vegetarian many times and I tried to be a vegetarian as a monk. But these days I've eaten so much food from different cultures and people always keep telling me, you must try this food, it's very delicious. It's not delicious, it's delicious for you, but sometimes it may make me sick. And over these years I've found out what works for me. Even little things like honey, I can't digest. And one of the reasons is, is because I did come from a poor family. We never had honey in the house. We just had sugar. So every time I try and take honey, it just leaves a very sore feeling in my tummy. The same way, same thing with, um, not garlic, but uh, what's the one you don't like? Sorry? Ginger, yeah. Ginger said, oh, if you've got a sore tummy, Ajahn Brahm, take some ginger. I know when you put ginger in stuff, because afterwards I have a sore tummy. I remember just at this uh, ceremony, they gave me some, oh, what's it called? Um, pa not papaya. Pumpkin soup. It was very delicious, but they put ginger in it. Supposed to make it more delicious. Had a very sore tummy all afternoon. So there are some things which you know, are not good for my constitution, be good for your constitution. And so because of that, whenever you give like a curry, then I, I can't keep asking you what are the ingredients. So that's why I try and keep more simple food. The more simple food, the more I can trust it's not going to harm me. And because I was brought up, my mother and father were very poor and simple. They were always eating usually meat and two veg. That was a common. And I think that just when I was in UK recently, they said, oh, we would like you to come back next year to teach a retreat. But the retreat is such simple food. They said, you probably won't like it. I said, simple food? Yeah, bring it on. That's the sort of food I find very easy to digest. And to prove it, some years ago, I can't remember how long ago, at Chempaka Buddhist Lodge, I was giving a talk. I think you said you saw it. It confirmed it's true. When it came to question time, I was answering some questions, and I said, look, you know, I have to go. He said, no, just one more question. And so I couldn't leave the stage as early as I should have done. And I, I really have to go. And I got up. I didn't make it. <clears throat> Projectile vomiting. But I'm very happy that happened. Because the people saw I wasn't making it up. If you want to make sure that this stage remains clean. <laughs> please thank you for all the people. And I'm very grateful. You know the food you have been offering me here. I'm grateful because I can digest it and be healthy and then give my nice talks afterwards. I hope they're nice talks anyway. So anyway, that's why you have to find out the type of food you can eat. And a lot of times that's how you've been brought up. What your tummy's got used to when it was young is learn how to digest those foods. Anyway, hopefully that answers the question. Is it possible to have stillness and joy together or stillness and pain together? How is stillness different from mindfulness? 
Stillness and joy usually get together. Stillness and pain, not really. Pain sometimes can obstruct the experience of stillness. It's almost like you're obliged to do something about the pain. But if you can be still inside the pain, the pain will usually disappear. That's really weird. There's too many experiences I've had as a monk. Because I'm a monk, you stay in places where you, you don't have the opportunity to get medication. And one of those experiences, I wrote about it a long time ago when I had a very bad toothache in the first year at Wat Banana Chart. And I went to the medicine cupboard. There's a medicine cupboard there with no medicine in it. <laughs> it was totally empty. That's a bit disappointing. But then I had this toothache late at night. There's no electricity, so there's no telephones. You can't, the nearest dentist is about 10 kilometers away. So you were stuck with a terrible toothache, which was getting worse and worse and worse and worse. And there's no way I could go to sleep. And even meditating, I sat down in my room to watch my breath. You couldn't watch the breath. The pain was just too strong. So I started some chanting. I had to stop that too. I was shouting the chant. I was desperate. I tried walking meditation, but then I was doing running meditation. It was You couldn't slow down at all because the pain was just too much. And that was the time I did remember, you know, what many wise teachers had said. Let go. And that was the first time I did letting go. I just said, I had no other choice. No medicine, meditation wasn't working, nothing was working, and I was desperate. I said, let go. And that was one of those memorable, amazing experiences. I just said that word to myself and the pain vanished. It was replaced by bliss. And it, that could happen was just mind-boggling. One moment you can be just not knowing how you can survive the next few minutes and then all the pain vanished and had this beautiful blissful experience. I'm just describing what happened. Why it happened, I'm not sure, but it taught me a lot. And so I just meditated for a few minutes. It was about two o'clock in the morning and the bell went at three. So I went back to my uh, room and just lay down and fell fast asleep. And when the bell rang an hour later, I woke up and had a toothache. It was still there, but not as much as the middle of the night. But it showed me the power of letting go, and how it can overcome all pain. Amazing, I'm still not sure how that really happens, but it does. One, how to not fall asleep during meditation. Have a cup of coffee? <laughs> no, don't do that. If, if the meditation is interesting, you can't fall asleep. I, one of those experiences I remember was just before going to university, I had about six or nine months off. I had you know, done all my A-levels at, uni at uh, when I was only 16. I was a smart, a smart aleck. And so you did the, the Cambridge entrance exam, and I was still only 17. I had nine months. You couldn't go up to Cambridge until you were 18. So in nine months, I had my entry to Cambridge all secured. So I got a job, worked all sorts of stuff, and then saved the money up and went over to the United States, North Africa first of all, United States next, to um, have some experience. I remember just I got bored with the United States very quickly. It was just the same as any other Western country. So I decided to go to Central America through Mexico. That's why I asked you about Oaxaca. I love Oaxaca. I did all these ancient ruins there. And then go further south into to Guatemala. And I always wanted to go to this place, Tikal, where they had these pyramids 
in the middle of the Yucatan Peninsula in the jungle. And I didn't have much money. <coughs> so it took about three or four days from Guatemala City to the port. I remember just going on this bus to the port there because halfway on the journey there was a blockade by the military and everybody had, all the males had to come out. That was me as well. They had machine guns trained on you. This was serious stuff. They said they were just looking for some insurgents. And so they had to check my passport. It's okay. Because in those days, if you, you know, <laughs> if you were illegal or something, you know, you get machine guns. But anyway, we made it to the port. And then the only way to get up to the next part of the journey was in a fishing boat, which left at midnight. And then you went up the Caribbean coast at dawn. And I was just hadn't slept all night. But then the dawn was spectacular over the Caribbean. And I noticed there's no way I could go to sleep. It was you know, one of the most gorgeous, beautiful, blissful things I'd ever seen. See the dawn come up. And I realized from that time on that when you're really having a lot of enjoyment, you can't go to sleep. Just the mind gets satisfied with the bliss of what you're experiencing. That's one of the reasons why. How not to fall asleep during meditation, the best way is just to really enjoy the meditation, see its benefit. And then you, just, you can't go asleep. There's just too much clarity and energy there. So, and it's actually better than coffee. It's the same type of energy, actually much purer energy, with no bad side effects. But nevertheless, if you're not to those stages in your meditation, please have a good night's sleep. And if your body and brain have slept enough, then it's easier to stay awake in your meditation. But I'm sure the same person who wrote this I would probably also say that when they go to sleep tonight, they can't go to sleep. <laughs> Have you ever noticed that? The people in the meditation, they fall asleep. <laughs> and when they go to the room, they can't fall asleep at all. Why? And the reason is because when you're here, you're trying to meditate. That makes you fall asleep. When you're in bed, you're trying to go to sleep. That keeps you awake. So, the way to overcome that is when this talk is over, this question and answer thing is over, you go to your bed, you lay down, and remember, now you can stretch out your legs. My legs are a bit sore. Now you can stretch out your legs. You've got a lovely mattress. It's soft. No one is asking you any questions. So when I, when I lay down in bed, I remember that. Oh, this is bliss. Why do I want to waste these very comfortable moments by going to sleep? I want to stay awake. Lay back, really comfortable, snuggled, tucked in, lovely pillow. I want to stay awake. Then you go to sleep straight away. How to not think too much about career. Yeah, that is one of my problems. I think too much about my career. <laughs> no, I don't. Nothing much to think about. I know my career trajectory. It's all worked out. I know what's going to happen. I'm going to keep coming back to BGF until I'm dropping dead. <laughs> and to Singapore, and to... I went to Thailand and to Korea and to, I don't know where else I went to Europe. Sorry? Anywhere else? And Indonesia, yeah, Indonesia as well, yeah. <laughs> Until I pass out. Will you let me die? <laughs> no. So, anyway, that's what happens. So, my career is very clear. That's why I don't need to think about it. But a lot of times, the more you think about it, the more you mess it up. 
So with your career, just you don't have to do anything right now for your career. You're on retreat, retreating from your career. You're not at the office now. So it's wonderful. You have this wonderful time. You don't have to do anything. So anyway, dear Ajahn, if we don't set time, when, how do we decide to come out of meditation or change posture? Every time, whoever wrote this question, every time you have meditated, you've always, you've always come out. <laughs> so trust that the things around you, the nature will decide. And how to change posture. What I've sometimes done is when I'm meditating and I get an ache in the leg or something, the first time I experience an ache or discomfort, I just ignore it. It's okay, it doesn't matter, you can be like that. If it comes back again the second time, I ignore it the second time. The third time it comes up, I focus on it and see if I can relax it. And if it doesn't relax, and it still hurts, then I move. Three times not moving, fourth time moving. That's kind of a middle way, because if you just ignore it totally and say, I'm going to sit, I'm not going to move, you get so tense, so painful. Remember this one monk who decided to do a 24-hour meditation without moving. When he came out of meditation, after 24 hours we're not moving, we had to send him to hospital to have, a, no joke, to have a double knee reconstruction. It's amazing sort of endurance, but very small wisdom. The monk is still alive and still a monk. I won't say who he is. So be wise. And for many people, many teachers these days, I'm very glad to see they also say, if you're really hurting, know the time when it's best to just to move, just to adjust your legs, adjust your butt. Then you can carry on meditating for another half an hour or an hour with no problem. How to be a kind to a mind that likes non-stop talking or keep repeating a song? You don't do non-stop talking. But when you're sitting here, you're very quiet. But if you're talking outside this meditation hall, the best practice is called masking tape. <laughs> and I always say that whenever we have noble silence, we should always get some masking tape. <laughs> For those people who can't keep the noble silence. But they say the likes non-stop talking. If you haven't known silence, then you may prefer talking. But when you know what silence is like, then that's far more preferable than talking. Silence is golden. You've heard that saying before, haven't you? And the price of gold always goes up. The value of words always goes down. I know that in a country like Malaysia, we have free speech. I'm against that. I think speech should be taxed. The more you speak, the more you have to pay. <laughs> Is that a good idea? <laughs> okay, anyway. You keep repeating a song. Oh my goodness, it must be a terrible song. You have to keep repeating it. Is it a terrible song? That happened to me once. I've been a monk for such a long time. I was doing a visa in Bangkok. And as somebody went past my room, there was a song playing. And that once it got into my mind, I couldn't get it out again. So how I got it out eventually, and what I recommend, is once you have that song going in your mind, when you get to the end of the song, the last... I don't know, there's so many little songs I know these days. Say, God save the Queen, I don't know, that's not really a song. You, you make a big crescendo at the end. God save the Queen! Because that gives it an ending. 
And that may be what can stop that song going through your mind. At the very end, I think it louder, with more music behind it, the crescendo, yay, and it stops. That's serious, that actually worked for me. What is recollection? How to apply in meditation? Recollection, especially if you've just gone into a deep meditation, you ask afterwards, what was that? But a nice piece of um, a tip for you, when you've had a very powerful meditation, don't try and think what was there. Please investigate and recollect what was missing. What wasn't there? What had disappeared? You get far deeper insights that way. How to let go of the candles you hold on strongly. The only way to let go of the candles is to let go of the being who is holding them. You know in attachment, there's two ends of attachment. It's my hand which holds on to things, and just this part of it, the thing which does the holding. So don't just look at the end of what you're attaching to. Look at what's doing the attaching. And once you see that, you can let go of so many things all at once. This is your sense of self, and the sense of being in control. Okay, so I'm now going to uh, give an example of letting go. We'll do those another day. Thank you all for listening. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Excellent. Okay. So again, thanks for the questions. And I'm sure we'll be able to have more questions tomorrow. We did most of them. All of them are all here. Amazing. <laughs> so thank you again. If you want to carry on meditating, this hall is open all the time. Yeah, okay, good. So you can stay here as long as you wish. And there's always somebody here to accompany you. The three teddy bears. <laughs> Actually, yeah, there's three. I thought it was four teddy bears. Oh, the four was once over there. <laughs> Very good. So anyway, if not, I'll see you tomorrow morning. But please know if you're tired in the morning, you don't have to come up for the, uh, the morning chanting. If you really are tired, just have a sleep in. Be kind to your body. Be kind to your mind. Keep it natural. You're all inspired by what we've been doing the last couple of hours. You just go to the toilet, stretch your legs, and then come back and sit. So it means you can meditate to whatever time. And you know if you meditate really late, you can always have a sleep in and come in later. I'm pretty sure that you all know when 7.30 is the time for breakfast. You don't need a clock for that. Okay, good night. <laughs>